And hello again, my name is Tom Irvine and I'm the instructor for these, this series of webinar units. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, NESC, as well as Dr. Curtis Larson for making this series of webinars possible. Now today we're going to be talking about sample rates and Nyquist frequencies and aliasing. And this pertains to the collection of dynamic data. It could be accelerometer data or pressure transducer data or even dynamic strain gauge data. And it's very critical that we understand how the data was collected and what parameters were used for sampling the data because we need to apply some critical thinking skills to any data that we receive from any other uh, technician or, or engineer who's actually measured the data. Or in some cases, we may be the one who is, uh, we may be the ones who are setting up the uh, measurement equipment data acquisition systems. So it's just some important things we need to know, some important guidelines and rules of thumb. I'd like to start off showing you a video clip. We, we may have seen this once before, but let's go ahead and take a look at, at this. And this is a ceiling fan. And as we look from the floor upwards, the blades are always spinning counterclockwise. Now, now the way I ran this fan, this is in a home I previously owned, is I actually, I actually uh, ramped up the speed. So there's angular acceleration occurring, and then it uh, briefly reached a steady state speed. And then I turned the, the speed down so it would, the angular acceleration or deceleration would, would go to, would drop the fan speed down to zero. But as, as you look at this fan, and obviously we're looking at this clip two or three times here, in some cases it appears that the blades are spinning backwards. Well, the same thing can happen with vibration data if it's not collected correctly. So what we're going to do in this series of units is we're going to try and come up with some, some guidelines. We will come up with some guidelines for how data should be collected, as well as giving us the questions that we should ask of whoever uh, gives us measured data. So back to the slides here. So the Nyquist frequency, we've, we've talked about this before, it is equal to one half the sample rate. And the sample rate, uh, sometimes we say it's represented in terms of samples per second, or sometimes we just say hertz, which is, uh, I, I guess that works as well. And there's Shannon sampling theorem, and this states that a sample time history must not contain components at frequency above, the frequencies above the Nyquist frequency. Um, if that rule is violated, then we get alias, aliasing in our signals. And in terms of the optical analogy, it, uh, it looks like the uh, ceiling fan blades are spinning backwards. And, and, that, and that can be horribly misleading if that aliasing occurs. So let's talk about uh, some of the ways we collect accelerometer data or any sort of dynamic data. And I'm going to kind of focus a bit on the aerospace industry here. So here we have an avionics module or interstage or, or some sort of rocket vehicle module, and it's mounted on a shaker table. And you can see there's red cables uh, leading to the accelerometers, which are mounted at various stations to measure the response. So sometimes we measure accelerometer response data during a shaker test, or we might actually have flight accelerometer telemetry data, or stage separation da data from a ground test, uh, where there's some sort of pyrotechnic uh, charge that's initiated. Uh, sometimes we do static fire tests of solid rocket motors or liquid engines uh, where, where the motor engine is affixed to a heavy-duty frame uh, test stand so that the, the motor or engine cannot move. And there's various laboratory tests we do. Now, now some of you may work in automotive or you may work in uh, on, on ships or trains or aircraft or military vehicles. and, and and regardless of which of these industries that you, you, you may work in, uh, you, you most likely go out and collect field data from time to time, or someone collects that on your behalf. And, and e even things like uh, semiconductor fabs, uh, sometimes we're concerned about the floor vibration. If, there, if there's a, a wafer polishing machine and uh, the vibration from that wafer polishing machine is propagating uh, through the base of the machine to the floor and then propagating onwards to a, a crystal growth furnace, for example, 
uh, there could be some real vibration concerns there because the crystal growth uh, process could be very sensitive to vibration. So that there's, regardless of what industry you're in, uh, presumably there's some uh, field data that uh, you have the opportunity to collect or to view at some point. So let's talk about analog to digital conversion. So uh, let's say we have an accelerometer and it, it produces or outputs an analog signal. Then that gets passed through a, a signal conditioner and ideally there should be an analog low pass filter in place. And then that filter needs to be the appropriate type and set to the appropriate cutoff frequency. And then the, the output analog data is then sent to an analog to digital converter. So we have a data acquisition system that has an analog to digital converter built in. Uh, nowadays it's very common that uh, data acquisition systems will also have built in uh, signal conditioners and analog low pass filters as well. So you may have one of those models. Okay, so uh, again, the, the analog low-pass filtering is needed to prevent aliasing. We'll talk more about the, the rules of thumb and the guidelines for, for low-pass filters uh, later on in this unit. So we're going to set up two requirements. Now these are going to be for selecting the sample rate. And just basically, the higher the sample rate, the better off we're going to be for collecting data. But on the other hand, we don't want to drink, take a drink of water from a fire hose either. And if our sample rate is so high, we end up with terabytes of data. Well, that's that's not a good thing. <laughs> so there's got to be some reason, you know, reasonable moderation. Uh, but 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 it's best to have the sample rate as high as is reasonably possible. So we're going to have two requirements for sample rate, and we need to fulfill both requirements. So the first one is going to be that the, uh, the sample rate must be greater than the maximum analysis frequency. So when I say maximum analysis frequency, that's our maximum frequency of interest. So we're going to set up this formula here. The minimum sample rate must be greater than or equal to n times the maximum analysis frequency, or the maximum frequency of interest. Now, if we're going to do a frequency domain analysis, that could be a Fourier transform, or a fast Fourier transform, or a waterfall FFT, or a power spectral density. If, if we do any of those sorts of functions, then this n value has to be at least 2. And, it, it's, and, and again, this is based on the Shannon sampling uh, rule that we talked about earlier. But some sources, some uh, reference sources say, well, let's be a little more conservative and let's set n equal to 2.5. And later on I'll show you, well, it's, it's even better if we could have n equal to 3.33. <laughs> so, but, 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 but again, the higher our, our sample rate is, the better off we're going to be. Now we also do time domain calculations. And the, the classic one, I, th I think, is the uh, shock response spectrum calculation. And we're going to cover sh shock response spectrum in an upcoming webinar unit, uh, uh, several from now. Uh, but but the, the shock response spectrum calculation is actually performed in the time domain. Now, if we have a time domain calculation, we're looking at the time domain responses, then this n value here should be, we, we, need, we need 10 or, or preferably even higher. So let's say, for example, we have a shock response spectrum that needs to go up to 10,000 hertz natural frequency. So that means our minimum sample rate should be 100,000 samples per second, or you might say 100 kilohertz. And that should be the minimum sample rate. Again, the higher the better. So these are just some rules of thumb uh, to get started with, and we'll be talking uh, about a couple others here in the upcoming slides. So the, the frequency domain requirement is based on the fact that at least two time domain coordinates per cycle are required to resolve a sine wave. The frequency domain analysis thus extends up to the Nyquist frequency, which again is one half the sample rate. And then as I, I've already mentioned, you may come across uh, more conservative references that say that that n value for frequency domain should be 2.5 or even 3.33. Okay, I covered this one already. Um, 
So the shock response spectrum is calculated in the time domain, and the numerical engine that's embedded in the shock response spectrum, the, 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 the typical one is the Smallwood Ramp Invariant Ditch Recursive Filtering Relationship. And if you've been following along on our, our previous webinars, we've actually done uh, some time domain calculation just for uh, a single natural frequency or a single single degree of freedom system where we've actually performed this uh, calculation. And that was, uh, if you go to the vibration data GUI package, and this is up to 4.6. Um, so if we have a time history input and its acceleration, we can do the single degree of freedom response to a base input. So if we begin the signal analysis here, uh, so this, this script calculates the response of a single degree of freedom system to base excitation. The input data must have two columns, time in seconds and base acceleration. And if, again, if you've been following the previous webinar units, we've actually done some cases where we've taken sine functions or sine sweep or white noise, and we've calculated the, uh, the time domain response. And this, again, is using the Smallwood Ramp Invariant Digital Recursive Filtering Relationship. So anytime we do the, these sorts of uh, time domain calculations, our sampling rate must be 10 times higher than the maximum frequency of interest. And where did that come from? Well, there's the IES, and actually it's, it's now called the IEST, but it was previously called the uh, IES. In fact, if uh, the reference that we're going to talk about, I'll just I'll show you real quick here. If we go to uh, www.iest.org, then this is the Institute of Environmental Sciences and Technology, and they offer different uh, standards and handbooks and, and things, and you can uh, uh, browse around and find the uh, the reference that I'm going to present here. This is the Dynamic Data Acquisition and Analysis Handbook. And previously this org organization was just called IEST, IES, I should say, now it's IEST. And in the first edition of this handbook, uh, there, there was a rule, and I assume the similar rules in the, the, the more recent uh, edition, but uh, here's, here's what it has to say, this reference has to say. Unlike other spectral quantities evolving from the discrete Fourier transform computations, the SRS is essentially a time domain quantity. Hence, the digital sample rate given by, so RS would be the uh, sample rate, 1 over delta T introduces errors beyond those associated with aliasing about the Nyquist frequency. Thus, RS, the sample rate, must be high enough to accurately describe the response of the SRS oscillators. To minimize potential error, it is recommended that the SRS computations be performed with a sample rate that's greater than or equal to 10 times FH, where FH is the highest natural frequency of the SRS computation. So another, word, another way of thinking about this is that if we have a, a sine function, we want to have at least 10 points per period to accurately model that sine function as well as to give the oscillator a sufficient number of points to respond to that sine function. So that's the time 10 rule. OK, so we've already covered one rule. Our first rule was, was based strictly on what's our maximum frequency of interest. But we also need to satisfy a second requirement. And this requirement is that the sample rate must be greater than the maximum frequency present in the source energy at the measurement location. This requirement is independent, or at least it can be independent, of the maximum analysis frequency. So for this rule, we have the minimum sample rate is greater than or equal to m times the maximum frequency in the source energy. So for a frequency domain analysis, m would equal to 2. So the minimum sample rate should be twice the uh, maximum source energy frequency. But if we're doing a time domain calculation, again, we have that value of 10, that our sample rate should be greater than or equal to 10 times the maximum frequency in the source energy. And again, you may see for the frequency domain integer there, you may see 2.5 or 3.33, depending on how many references uh, 
you, you, you look through. So we've got two requirements, and we need to we need, the minimum sample rate must satisfy both. But here's here's the huge problem we have. What is the maximum frequency in the source energy? And the answer is, in in most cases, we simply do not know. Now, if we're in the lab and we're doing a shaker test, and it's a controlled shaker test with a feedback accelerometer, and all the equipment's calibrated. You know, for, for a shaker test in the lab, we have a pretty good idea of what the maximum frequency is going to be in the source energy. That can be controlled reasonably well. But if we're doing our field test, if, we're, if, we're, if we have an, our wind tunnel data or our pyrotechnic shock or our flight accelerometer data, our static fire test from the rocket motor, what is the maximum frequency in the source energy for each of those cases? Let's be honest and let's just say we don't know. We just don't know. So here's, here's the real way that we meet that second requirement, is we're going to pass the data through an analog low-pass anti-aliasing filter. And if we set the cutoff frequency properly, then we can satisfy that second requirement. So the cutoff frequency is typically set at or slightly above the maximum analysis frequency. And there's some rules for thumb rules of thumb for cutoff frequency that we'll be uh, discussing. So now we're back to that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the IES handbook for dynamic data acquisition and analysis. And, and these are the, the old school guidelines in the, in the first edition of this handbook. And, and the, the latest and greatest edition may have a, a somewhat different rules, but we're, we're going to be old school here. So let FC be the cutoff frequency. Now, when we're dealing with low-pass fil filters for anti-aliasing, typically we would have a Bessel filter or a Butterworth filter. Yeah, so F FC would be the filter cutoff frequency. F sub N there would be the Nyquist frequency, again, half the sample rate. So the guideline is a low-pass anti-aliasing filter with a cutoff rate of at least 60 dB per octave should be used for the analog to digital conversion of all dynamic data. With a 60 dB per octave cutoff rate, the half power point cutoff frequency of the filter should be at least FC is greater than or equal to 0 0.6 times the Nyquist frequency. If the anti-aliasing filter has a more rapid cutoff, fre cutoff rate, a higher cutoff frequency can be used, but the, down but the bound cutoff frequency less than or equal to 0 0.8 times the Nyquist frequency should never be exceeded. So these are, this is a guideline for setting the, the filter frequency for our, for our analog low-pass anti-aliasing filter. And let's just, let's just take a look here at uh, a couple things that can happen. So here we have a sine function, and it's a 200 hertz sine function, and I'm going to say this is an accelerometer time history. So we have acceleration in G versus time in seconds. The 200 hertz sine function is sampled at 2,000 samples per second. So that gives us 10 points per period. So you can see here's one period of a sine function, and we have 10 points. And our, our rule of thumb is that if we have 10 points per sine function, that's a sufficient number of points to characterize that sine function. The more the better, obviously. So the Nyquist frequency for this case is 1000 hertz. That's half the sample rate. Now, 200 hertz is well below 1000 hertz. Therefore, there should be no violation of Shannon's sampling theorem. There should be no aliasing. And in fact, the next step, we're going to take a Fourier transform. So we take the Fourier magnitude, and we have acceleration g versus frequency in hertz. Our sine function is 200 hertz. So we get a nice clean spectral line at 200 hertz. The amplitude is 1. Again, this was sampled at 2,000 samples per second. So 1,000 hertz here is the Nyquist frequency. So everything is well and good. And good. We get a nice clean spectral line. 200 hertz, 1G, and, and again here, here we have our 200 hertz, 1G sine function. 
in the time domain. So no surprises, all is well and good. And this, this spectral line here is something we could design and test to. So everything is well and good at this point. Well, now let's take an 1800 hertz sine function. Again, it'll have 1G amplitude. And this time, we're also going to sample it at 2,000 samples per second. Well, the problem is our Nyquist frequency is at 1,000 hertz, and 1,800 hertz is above 1,000 hertz. Therefore, we're in violation of Shannon's sampling theorem, and we're going to get an aliasing error. So the, the 1,800 hertz data is actually this blue curve here, this nice blue sine function. That's 1,800 hertz. Now you see these red markers here? These red markers are the effect of digitizing the data. And it turns out for each one cycle of a sine function, for this case, there are only 1.11 points per period. Now just imagine you know, you're, you're a young child again doing a dot-to-dot -dot puzzle, and we're going to connect the red markers. So imagine connecting those red markers. Well, if we do that, we're no longer going to have an 1800 hertz sine function. In fact, let's see what happens in our Fourier transform. Well, before I show you that, here's both of our, of our signals. Each are sampled at 2,000 samples per second. Each has an acceleration, 1G, peak amplitude. And we've got our 200 hertz is the blue curve with 10 points per period. And our red curve is what we actually think our, our 1800 hertz sine function is. Only now our 1800 hertz sine function is appearing also as a 200 hertz signal. Now the fact that those two signals are, are um, 180 degrees out of phase, we're not, we're not, we're not going to pay attention to the, to the phase angle in this case. But the fact is both signals come out in the time domain looking like a 200 hertz signal even though the red one is really an 1800 hertz signal. So, so the red one has the aliasing error. You could, you could say it was undersampled. The sample rate was insufficient. So now we've, we're, get, we're again taking a 4A magnitude, acceleration G versus frequency in hertz. And that 1800 hertz sine function, sampled at 2000 samples per second, now gets folded about the Nyquist frequency so 1,000 hertz is the Nyquist frequency, so that energy gets folded about, folded about in a symmetric manner about the Nyquist frequency, and we get a spectral line at 200 hertz, 1G. Well, if we just took this data as is, and we did not apply critical thinking skills, and we failed to ask the right questions about how the data was taken, we very well might end up designing and testing our equipment to withstand 1G at 200 hertz. Well, that would be bogus. That would be the improper thing to do because in reality, our source energy that we must design and test for is at 1800 hertz. So this really happens. And, and the problem with this data, you could say one of two problems occurred, or you could say both occurred. One, it was just sampled at an insufficient sample rate. The sample rate was too low. In fact, let, let's state that one positively. We can positively say the data was undersampled. We're also being hurt by the fact that there was no analog anti-aliasing filter. If there was, if, an, if, a, if a proper analog anti-aliasing filter had been used, then there would be no spectral line at 200 hertz at 1G. Now, whether our equipment is sensitive to energy above 1,000 hertz, that's another part of, the, uh, part of the puzzle. In some cases it might be, in some cases it might not be. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to show you a case history. Now, here, here's some flight accelerometer data where some aliasing occurred. So what we have here is a launch vehicle. It's a suborbital vehicle. And this is a waterfall FFT. And we actually looked at waterfall FFTs uh, earlier in an earlier course unit. So we've got uh, time in seconds along one axis, frequency in hertz along another. And uh, this was a, here, here's what's happening during, during the 
the first and actually the first and second stage uh, burn of this vehicle had a, a first stage that burned for a short time, if I recall correctly. So, so we have this row of peaks or column of peaks or however you want to call it. So we have a series of spectral peaks occurring here. And the series of spectral peaks is starting at about 10 hertz or so and then sweeping upwards to about 12 or 13 hertz. And this is due to the first body bending mode, or you could say the fundamental bend bending mode. And this is the type of the data that needs to be conveyed to the guidance and control engineers because they need to, to make sure that their, the stability of their algorithms uh, can, can handle this type of, of elastic body excitation and response during flight. Now, I should back up a little bit. This data was actually sampled at 100 samples per second, so the Nyquist frequency was 50 hertz. Now, this was not from a normal accelerometer designed and installed on the vehicle to measure vibration. Rather, this was from an accelerometer in the inertial navigation system. And it turns out that inertial navigation system accelerometer data is not passed through an analog anti-aliasing filter. And that's something that always has made me cringe a little bit. And I've tried to raise the issue with guidance and control engineers. And they kind of say, well, you know, go away, quit bothering me. <laughs> but, but actually, the sensor head uh, of this inertial navigation system, uh, that, this, that the sensor head itself is mounted on some mechanical low-pass isolators. So that you know, it, it achieves, partially achieves the, the uh, requirement for anti-aliasing, uh, although, although via mechanical means. I, I do want to back up. I think I, I told you a, mis a mistake earlier. I made a mistake. This was actually a single stage launch vehicle. So this was a single stage. So the data you, you see here is from, the, from the, the single stage motor burn. And again, we see the uh, first bending mode uh, spectral peaks. And those could have been excited by wind shears, by gusts, by buffeting, by shock waves, by thrust misalignment, uh, the, uh, the guidance and control system sending command for maneuvers or attitude control thrusters. There, there's various things, sources on a launch vehicle that can excite the fundamental bending mode. Now there's also a second bending mode. This starts up at about 22 hertz or so, and then the frequency increases with time. Now the reason both of these frequencies are increasing with time is because the mass is being expelled. And as mass is being expelled, the natural frequency for the bending modes go up. Now if we were to, to take this data just as is without applying critical thinking skills, we might say, oh wow, at the end of this motor burn, that uh, second body bending mode was really excited to some high levels. You know, what happened? What was going on? <laughs> and the fact is, well, that's not what happened with this data. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now that these peaks, the, the series of spectral peaks here, was due to aliasing. And it happens that, that the, the rocket motor for this vehicle, the solid rocket motor, has a thrust oscillation, or you might call it a resonant burn effect, that occurs from 65 to 75 hertz. Well, that data got aliased about the Nyquist frequency, and redeposited here around uh, 25 to 35 hertz or so. And actually, the, these frequencies were decreasing with time because as the cavity enlarges within a solid rocket motor, the combustion cavity that is, then, then the acoustic pressure natural frequencies decrease. <laughs> so in, in some se sense, it was useful that this aliasing occurred because we were, we were then able to get an idea of what was going on with the solid rocket motor's thrust oscillation. So that's just a little interesting story. And I actually want to show you some things uh, from vibration data from our GUI package here. And let's go to our GUI package. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, we're up to version uh, 4.6 here, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier. So if we go to miscellaneous functions and we go to aliasing frequencies, we can actually c calculate what a, what a resulting aliasing frequency would be for a particular case. 
So for this case, we know, for example, that the uh, thrust oscillation frequency was about 70 hertz. Of course, it changed with time, but actually 70 hertz would go in our source energy box here. And we were sampling at 100 samples per second, or 100 hertz. So if we calculate, we find out that our aliasing frequency should be about 30 hertz. And you can see here we do have uh, spectral peaks occurring at 30 hertz. But here's, here's something interesting is that uh, if, if, if we knew that aliasing occurred, but we were unaware that this particular rocket motor had that uh, cavity resonance, there could have been some higher and higher frequencies yet in terms of source energy that could have led to energy being deposited down here. So if we do candidate source frequencies, we say, okay, we had a sample rate of 100 samples per second, and our resulting aliasing frequency was at 30 hertz. What could have caused that? Well, so we do calculate, and we see, oh, that could have been due to 70 hertz source energy. And actually, we know that that to be the case because we have previous uh, data from the particular rocket motor, solid rocket motor, used on this flight. But we also see that, well, if we had a 130 hertz signal, that could have also led to a 30 hertz aliasing or, or, or so on. So there's, there's all these different frequencies where energy, the source energy could have resided, which then, uh, after one or more foldings about Nyquist frequencies and so on, would have, given it, would have resulted in a 30 hertz signal. <laughs> so those are just a, a few things about, uh, about aliasing. Uh, again, the best thing to do is apply critical thinking skills anytime you're receiving data from anyone else. And, and before we wrap up, I, I think I just want to go back and sort of go over one other thing again here. Um, let, let's, let's talk about this low-pass filtering again and these, these uh, requirements. So I'm, I'm going to just set up a little scenario here, and I'm going to say um, let's, let's do a frequency domain analysis, and our maximum frequency of interest is 2,000 hertz. So we're going we're gonna to have a frequency domain analysis, and we're going to have our maximum frequency at 2,000 hertz. So what should our sample rate be? So our sample rate... Now, we, we've got a couple of choices here. So our sample rate in hertz, our bare minimum should be at least twice. So if we want to analyze in the frequency C domain up to 2,000 hertz, our sample rate should be 4,000 hertz or greater. But, but actually, we, we, need to, we need to actually give us some more critical thinking here. And we have to realize that... Uh, we probably also had ought to have an anti-aliasing filter here because we're not sure where our maximum source frequency energy is. We may have source energy above 2,000 hertz. So let's, let's go back to the, um, the, uh, this rule here that our cutoff frequency for our filter should be greater than or equal to 0 0.6 times the Nyquist frequency. So I'm going to rearrange this a little bit, and I'm going to say, what am I going to say here? I'm going to say... I'm going to say instead of having a factor of 2, I'm going to do a more conservative 3.33 factor. So now my sample rate is going to be 6,660 hertz. So now my Nyquist frequency, so I'm going to say Nyquist, I'll put NY for Nyquist frequency, that is going to be equal to half the sample rate here. So that is 3,330 3, hertz for Nyquist frequency. Now let's follow our cutoff frequency rule here, and let's apply a value of 0 0.6. So if I apply a value of 0 0.6 here, then that comes out to be 1,998 hertz. And, and this will actually be, I'm just going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to raise that up to 2,000 hertz. In fact, what I'll do here is I'm going to say this is going to be FC, our cutoff frequency. So I'm going to say our cutoff frequency will be 2,000 hertz. So our cutoff frequency is actually going to be the, the minus 3 dB point for our filter. We'll talk more about filters in an upcoming unit. So for this, this little scenario here, 
Okay, we want to analyze in the frequency domain up to 2,000 hertz. So 2,000 hertz is our maximum frequency of interest. We're not sure where our maximum source energy is going to be. So let's set our sample rate up to uh, at least 6,660 hertz. And yeah, in, in reality, we'd probably round that up to 7,000 samples per second or 8,000 samples per second just to make it a, a, you know, a nice, uh, reasonable number. Then our Nyquist frequency will be one half the sample rate. Uh, for this case, 3,330 hertz. Our cutoff frequency using this other guideline from the IES. So our cutoff frequency for our analog anti-aliasing filter will be at 2,000 hertz, which matches this frequency here. And, and this would be a, a good, reasonable way to go uh, to collect our data. Now, if you want to say, well, yeah, but isn't that going to give us minus 3 dB, a minus 3 dB reduction for our spectral component, 2,000 hertz? Well, yes, it is. So if that's the case, well, I'll just keep bumping this up to 8,000 or even 10,000 samples per second. Uh, it, it's always a good idea to bump up your sample rate. So these are just a few, a few little guidelines and things uh, to think about, uh, either when you're setting up a data acquisition, data acquisition system for field measurement. Uh, maybe you're involved with uh, setting up a flight telemetry system. Or, 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 or maybe you're just on the receiving end of data that's come from a test lab or a wind tunnel test or from flight accelerometer data. Be thinking about all these things, all these rules of thumbs, all these guidelines. And that's all for our course unit uh, for now, and I'll, I'll see you next time. Again, my name's Tom Irvine, and thank you uh, for participating in this series of webinars. And goodbye. <laughs>